thank you thank you dr mahapatra dr ak das and all the other uh, people uh, all the other stalwarts who are here uh, i would be speaking on basal insulins how far we have reached now in the management of diabetes use of basal insulins in the management of diabetes so what i would try to do in the next uh, 12 minutes or so is to uh, speak uh, address it in three areas one is why basal insulins how they have been a breakthrough uh, uh, from nph2 uh, coming on to the first generation insulin analogs uh, the basal analogs and then uh, discuss about the first generation and then uh, quickly discuss about the second generation basal analogs that we have today so if you look at the first question as to, as to why nph is not enough and why we need the basal insulins so if you look at type 2 diabetes type 2 diabetes is a progressive disease where there is a constant uh, decline in the glucose i mean the of, of the beta cell function over the years and even at the time of diagnosis there's a there's a significant 50% re reduction in the insulin secretion and over the years this is going to progressively increase and uh, there is going to be a time when you require insulin supplementation and that is uh, that 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 requires the need for uh, use of early insulin and they have been a lot of uh, studies which have looked at early insulin initiation have shown the benefits of early insulin initiation and if you look at uh, the physiology of insulin secretion what we see is that uh, there's a uh, the, the the cartoon on the left so shows the normal uh, insulin secretion which happens in a, in two phases one is the baseline insulin secretion or the basal secretion which goes on throughout the day which maintains a constant level throughout the day and then you have the meal related uh, peak which occurs immediately in two phases the first phase of insulin secretion and the second phase of insulin secretion and uh, when you're looking at people with type 2 diabetes there is a there is a uh, delayed or uh, and blunted response in the type 2 diabetes particularly the the prandial uh, secretion is is blunted and then you have uh, a, a significant decline in the basal insulin secretion secretion also so basal insulin if you look at the amount of insulin secreted in the basal state that constitutes almost about 40 to 50% of the insulin secreted throughout the day and uh, this is the one that is limiting the hepatic glucose production and lipolysis in the fasting state especially in the overnight fasting state and uh, so this is something which which is very important and this is something which is uh, which could be uh, Uh, which could be which when replaced could edit, provide a much better glycemic uh, control and if you look back today when we are in the 100 years of insulin discovery we have uh, uh, we have been celebrating that in, this year and what we see is that uh, the once insulin came in it made a huge difference huge impact in terms of the of improving the lifespan of people with type 2 type, type 1 diabetes but what we also realized over the years was that uh, we needed a to to mimic the the normal insulin secretion the physiological insulin secretion what was required was to uh, to to increase durational action of the insulin and for that we have the longer acting and the basal insulin that were that were developed in 1936 the first step was made in the, was taken in the form of of uh, the de uh, of uh, protein protaminating the insulin and producing the longer acting formulations like protamin zinc insulin and then then came the lenti insulin which were very popular at at particular time and now we have the nph insulin which came out from that the neutral protamine hexone so the addition of basic protein uh, led to the production of nph insulin then from there we have gone ahead uh, with the production of the analogs with the development of the analogs the the, the first generation analogs like glargine and detimir and then we have gone on to the development of second generation analogs in the form of uh, degludec and even u300 glargine as you can see so um, nph came in in 1946 it was originally animal sourced and today nph we have the human uh, uh, nph which is uh, made from the uh, from the uh, recombinant dna human insulin and the challenges with nph are that although it uh, it did make a difference in the when it was brought, introduced but what we have realized over the years is that it uh, has a shorter duration of action i mean it it has action lasting for about 14 to 16 hours and that's why it's uh, that is insufficient to provide a 24 hour basal coverage 
there's a need for multiple injections and need for resuspension of the insulin because it's a it's a, 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 a insulin which is which is available as a suspension and it needs to be resuspended and uh, homogenized before it is to be used so that is a, a factor which if that is not done properly then that can lead to a variability in its its action the other important thing is that uh, uh, there is a peak which is which is sometimes which is usefully i mean which is utilized well when it is given in the morning in the uh, in the premix insulin you find the peak that comes up by the afternoon takes care of the 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 uh, requirement for prandial insulin in the afternoon can be oh, can be avoided by the use of nph in the morning but in the night when you use nph that peak can be unpleasant for some some of these people with diabetes and can cause the early morning hypoglycemia so this is something which is uh, uh, the the problem with NPH insulin and the day to day variability that is there is also the major issue. So that led to the question of basal insulin analogs. The first generation analog was developed in the form of new uh, three new uh, hundred large gene, which is basically an acidic uh, molecule which is uh, stabilized at an acidic pH and once it is injected. There's precipitation of glargine in subcutaneous tissue at the at the at the pH of the of the interstitial fluid, and there it crystallizes and it's gradually uh, broken down and uh, absorbed over the over the 24 hour period, and that's that leads to its protected action. There's a change in the structure, as you can see here, the change in structure addition of two arginine molecules, and a change on even at at A21. So these are the changes in the structure which led to the led to the change in the in the solubility characteristics of this insulin. Follow, I mean, the other first generation analog that we have is insulin detimer, which is mainly um, produced by adding a fatty acid side chain, which increases the duration of action of uh, which br brings it away, which allows the insulin to bind to albumin and thereby causes a protraction of its action. Uh, the First generation analogs certainly brought about a, a big change in terms of uh, when you compare it with NPH insulin, there was a decrease in variability and reduce a reduction in the risk of hypoglycemia, particularly nocturnal hypoglycemia came down very significantly with the use of the of the uh, insulin first generation basal analogs as compared to NPH. Both in type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes, you can see that the, the benefit that was produced was in type 2 diabetes to the tune of 2 to 53 percent, and in type 1 diabetes, it was anywhere between 20 to 46 percent reduction in, in nocturnal hypoglycemia. That was the major benefit that was seen with the introduction of these basal insulins. And the unmet needs of the first generation analogs was that they still had some amount of variability. They needed to be given fixed dose time. Fixed time dosing was required because they had. A, I mean, glargine has a twenty-four hour action, and it has to be given at the fixed time of the day. Higher nocturnal hypoglycemia rates. As the nocturnal hypoglycemia rates, though lower than that uh, produced by NPH, were still uh, un unpleasant at some times. And uh, and and some of them. I mean, at at times you could see in some individuals there was still a peaking, and that led to the variability in their actions. So. This led to the generation of uh, the development of second generation analogs, which are probably flatter than the, the first generation basal analogs. You have in this category, you have large gene U300 and Degutec. As you can see here, this, these are the first generation analogs. NPH is what we started off with in 1946. And uh, now we have insulin Degutec, which has got two uh, different modes of protection of its action. That is, one is by by uh, change in the structure, which make, makes it uh, uh, the addition of the fatty acid side chain again. Once again, it's a hexadecanoyl uh, uh, side chain, which is uh, bound with a glutamic acid spacer. And uh, there are two modes of protraction. One is what is happening is that there at the side of injection, there's a formation of the dihexamer formation. And then uh, because the uh, removal of phenol, the depletion of phenol after the injection, of, into the subcutaneous tissue and therefore there is a subcutaneous tissue depot and then it, it is gradually absorbed from there over a period of uh, uh, several hours and the monomers that are absorbed also go into the circulation and bind to the albumin and thereby have a further protection of their action. So uh, while if you look at glargine U300, the this is a threefold concentrated version of insulin glargine and the, the idea is was to prolong the action of glargine further than what you what we what was seen with u300 glargine u100 glargine so that leads to a smaller volume of ingestion injection more compact subcutaneous depot 
with smaller surface area and more gradual and slower release from the depot surface. And this leads to, if you look at the uh, at the pharmacodynamics, you can see that there is a more protected action of insulin U300, uh, U, uh, glargin U300 as compared to U100, which still has a uh, has some peaking as compared to U300, which has a typical flatless uh, profile. So let's look at uh, how they have really made a difference in terms of clinical practice. You could see from different studies, there is a, a, a reduction in both nocturnal and severe hypoglycemia. And this reduction is to the tune of, of almost 40 to 50% reduction in, in, uh, in uh, different studies. And if you look at some of the real world studies like the EU treat to diet, to target type 2 diabetes study, you could see that there was a huge difference, huge difference in terms of the overall hypoglycemia, 61%, 90% uh, reduction in nocturnal hypoglycemia, and 92% reduction in severe hypoglycemia. So there is a significant difference between the between the second generation versus the first generation uh, uh, basal insulin. And uh, here it depicts the, the, uh, the relationship between, between the uh, between the uh, glycemic lowering versus the risk of hypoglycemia, and we see that uh, with the second, uh, with the use of glargine uh, deglutec, the second generation analog, as compared to glargine U100, you could see a flatter uh, uh, line suggesting that. One minute left, sir. Hypoglycemia. Yeah, I'll be concluding in a minute or so. So deglutec has a lower day-to-day uh, -day variability also as compared to uh, insulin glargine U100. And this glycemic variability leads to a uh, significant lower uh, variability with the, uh, with the second generation analogs. And, and uh, that leads to lowering of the hypoglycemia risk, particularly the nocturnal hypoglycemia. The diurnal hypoglycemia risk may be comparable, but the nocturnal hypoglycemia risk benefit is clearly seen between these two generations of analogs. And there is also better time in range and lower time below range with the use of these second generation analogs as compared to the first generation analogs. And there is data from the uh, from both these analogs. If you look at glargin U300, you have phase three data showing lower HB1C levels, better HB1C control, lower uh, uh, lower risk of hypoglycemia, and producing the same uh, degree of uh, I mean the the glycemic lowering being produced with lower risk of hypoglycemia. And when you compare both these uh, analogs, the second generation uh, uh, basal analogs, you find that there is not much to choose between them. They have, uh, they they still have some differences in terms of the nocturnal hypoglycemia. Different studies have shown different uh, uh, different results. You have some studies showing uh, slightly better res uh, results with uh, with the U three hundred glargin, while others show uh, better results with degrudec. But all in all, what we see is that uh, there is better flexibility with the use of these analogs and the second generation analogs and and also uh, lower nocturnal hypoglycemia risk and better time in range as can be seen uh, from these two analogs. So the guidelines recommend that there is uh, a need for initiating insulin and uh, the preferred initiation is with basal insulin when there is uh, uh, and, and that remains as the as the first choice of insulin therapy uh, in patients who are who are insulin naive, and uh, so guidelines are unanimously recommending basal insulin at initiation, and that uh, provides uh, a, a good starting point to start off with insulin with, and then that can be in, uh, intensified with uh, with prandial insulin when required. And even uh, a recent uh, uh, recommendation regarding uh, the use of insulin during COVID nineteen pandemic has been, I mean, from the Indian expert panel is also recommended starting with uh, uh, basal in insulin analogs, which are the simplest and most convenient option and uh, initiated during in-person consultation, but uh, uh, wherever possible to initiate with in-person consultations. And uh, just look to just uh, to show the practicality about this use, it could start off with this with, with a it could be with uh, you start off with uh, a, a recommendation of starting over 10 units of insulin to start initiate and then adjust it every third day and you could reach the goal that you're looking at and uh, a target fasting plasma glucose goal of 100 milligrams per day. so i would end with showing the various mer merits of uh, basal insulin where you uh, see the benefits in terms of uh, establish their efficacy uh, in lowering the glucose levels lowering the hb1c 
getting down the fasting glucose levels to to control simple and convenient treatment regime preferred uh, insulin for initiation and preferred for initiation even during uh, co the covid-19 pandemic and is supported by both local and global guidelines so with that i would conclude i would say the in summary that we have gone a long way uh, from the from nph from uh, to the first generation analogs and now the second generation analogs which have greatly improved the uh, the reduce the variability and have a uh, risk of hypoglycemia that i'll thank you all and i'll be happy to answer any questions